all right we are live on linkedin uh, hi everyone good evening uh, welcome to our today's panel discussion powered by rebase by recro uh, thank you for joining in uh, taking your time uh, for this weekend and joining in the session is going to be really good we have an exciting panelist here joining us with us today so excited for this uh, panel discussion before uh, would really like to know where you guys are from so you can put over in your chat uh, where you guys are from, where you currently are working in. Let's make this chat also a little more int interactive. Uh, for uh, Starting with the uh, flow of this panel discussion, we'll start with a short introduction and then afterwards, Durgayu would be taking over the panel discussion where he'll be moderated. And then uh, towards the end of the session, we can have a, a Q and A's. So you can put in uh, any questions you have regarding uh, the discussion after discussion on forth. Uh, in the chat and we'll take it forward after the end of the panel discussion. All right. So we are live on LinkedIn. And um, as I mentioned before, this uh, this panel discussion is powered by Rebase by Recro. Uh, I'll just give a quick introduction about Rebase by Recro for all who are new to this community, uh, new here and here and uh, about the a community for the first time we are a community of developers having 3000 followers and it's uh, growing each day so basically we are trying to provide a platform for developer growing developers such as yourself to you know interact with fellow developers and learn from each other we also have in our community amazing uh mentors such as uh ashish uh, rishi and sumithya are a part of our community mentors who has a wealth of knowledge and experience and they take time to do mentorship sessions for the community members which is exclusive uh, exclusive community event uh, where they talk about interview preparation uh, and so on, career guidance and so on and so forth like that. Uh, apart from this, we also have uh, meetups where we do in several parts of the cities such as Rajkot, Bangalore, Ahmedabad uh, and so on. La uh, this month itself, we had a meetup in Jaipur and uh, Jaipur and Indore. So definitely it's it has been a very uh, good experience for those who have joined in here apart from that also we have other community events uh, such as webinars which we are hosting right now here this, uh, and so on and so forth uh, would really uh, you know ask you guys to come and join our community explore our community we are active on discord you can explore our community and yeah and get to know each other i will be sharing the link to join our community in the chat uh, do come and explore the server. So without further ado, let's start with the panel discussion here. As I mentioned, we have amazing panelists here joining us. And this panel discussion is also quite, uh, you know, special to us because we are having three of our mentors uh, here joining us today and uh, really excited to have. And we have Durgayu also here who is a community member and I've been a very active community member here. So excited to have you here. Um, let's start with the introduction. Uh, Rishi, would you like to go forward with your introduction? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Really glad to be part of the session. Uh, excited. Uh, hi, all. My name is Rishi Prakash. I, uh, I'm working for Microsoft uh, Europe Dublin campus, and I have around 10 years of experience. Uh, I have been part of Recro community since last two years, if I remember. Uh, superb. Uh, and looking forward to the session. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ashish, you want to go next? Hey, yeah. Uh, so my name is Ashish and I work as a software developer uh, at Uber and I have close to around eight years of experience. I've been gu guiding and mentoring uh, in Rebase uh, by Recro uh, uh, from 2022. And I mostly work on backend technologies. So thank you so much, Candida, for inviting me as a, a panelist in, in the discussion for today's topic. Happy to have you here. Sumit? Yeah, sure. So hi, uh, Canada, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us together for this amazing session. So I have uh, uh, about 10 years experience in the industry, mainly into startups. Uh, worked with two startups uh, in the start of my career and then started on my own called Park Wheels. Uh, built that for four years and then exited through it. Uh, it got acquired by Park Plus and then uh, served as head of engineering at Park Plus for again two years. Uh, post that, uh, serving VP technology at Mr. Milkman, which is a subsidiary of US-based company called Avarac. So mostly into startups and mostly from 0 to 1 and 1 to 10 journey. So system design is something which I have done repeatedly 
over the years uh, with multiple uh, use cases and scenarios. Uh, Durga, you want to connect? Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, I'm working as a SSE in uh, Yellow.ai. Uh, Yellow.ai is a customer automation platform. And I have worked with a few startups as well for OTT platforms. So yeah, I am also a bit included in all the system designs and all the conversation. The topic is so hot, like we always want to discuss it and it's very intellectual to have. Thanks, Candida. Uh, and I'll also like to thank everyone to join in. Yeah, we can start. All right. Uh, as mentioned here, this panel discussion is going to be about system design. Uh, excited for the panel discussion. It's going to be a very insightful session. Uh, Durgai, you can take over. The stage is yours. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. So uh, before starting, uh, I just want anyone like to put on the what is actual system design is. Uh, I, I think Ashish, can you please go ahead? What system design? No, just give a, a bit of context. So I think in layman's terms, if we want to explain it to five years uh, kid, what we'll say that any anything which we, we want to create, uh, we have to create a blueprint of it. And that's a that's a, in, in one word that that is what called as a designing a system before building it you have to collect all the pieces all the requirements that what we want to achieve uh, from the system from anything which we are creating and then designing it from the scratch that what is the scope of it and and then presenting it uh, as a blueprint before starting any any work on that so yeah, and we also focus on the complexity of the system and like building from lower to high scale or to large scale system. We do as things, right? Yeah, right. Uh, like we prehand see that what how much complex our system will be, whether it will be for millions of millions of users or it will be used by only few users internally. And based on our requirements, we decide the trade-offs uh, between what do we want to use and what do we want to avoid. So yeah, got it. Yeah. So um, uh, so Mister and Rishi, do you want like to focus more on this five part? Can you make it brighter? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So I'll go first. So uh, so whatever. So I'll take some analogies to explain what system design uh, actually means. So for example, let's say I'll take an example of uh, from my career itself. So let's say you want to build an application for food delivery or for example, milk delivery like Country Delight, right? This is the purpose or this is the goal that we want to do. Now, what all, how it will be done is how you start thinking about system design. So the system is you want to deliver milk to consumers on a daily basis, let's say. Now you will identify components and stakeholders. So you'll identify, you'll start identifying components. You'll start identifying stakeholders. How the process will work, how each component or stakeholder will interact with the system, and how these pieces would evolve over the time, uh, specifically as the usage starts growing. So whatever you want to do, how you club, how you how you club multiple pieces and multiple components together, and how these function together is basically, uh, uh, you can say, is a system design. So, and if I take some another analogy, so for example, uh, you want to play a game. As kids, let's say you want to play a game. You design some rules that this is what we want to achieve. This is, these are the different rules of the game. These are the different components of the game. So whatever you do, system design is a very generic word or a very generic concept. In technology, it can we can go further into very specific aspects of it. But from a generic aspect, what do you want to achieve? You have to identify how it will work and what it will achieve. Great. Yeah, Rishi, you want to put some light on again, the same thing, like extending more about the introduction system design. Uh, no, I will go ahead with what Ashish and Sumit said, plus one to that. I think this, this covers okay. the whole nation. Yes. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, so uh, starting a learning and system design and all. So being a beginner or very novice, we always have a question like, how can we effectively learn and practice system design when they are like very new for anyone and they have a lack of a starting point? Yeah. Uh, maybe I can take this one. Sure, sure. 
Okay. So uh, if you are like very new to the system design, uh, what you can do is uh, it's a form of problem solving. First, understand that that it's a what what problem you are trying to solve. You are trying to design a software system. Uh, so you understand the problem. For example, WhatsApp is a problem, or so it worked for Milkman. That that is a problem, and from there you devise what are your requirements requirements with which you can achieve the solution. Uh, and then you devise those requirements into what are your business requirements and what are your non-business or non-functional requirements. Uh, business requirement could be that, oh, uh, you possibly want to have a messaging queue or you might not want to have a messaging queue. Uh, that's one. Uh, the non-functional requirement would be that, uh, do you want to keep it available all the time? And then you want to sacrifice something else. So starting from the scratch of what the problem is and then see what kind of requirements you want to fulfill and then search what are the available tools and options options there for covering those, those requirements. And then you will find that there are more than one options available. And then comes the case where you will see the trade-offs. So system design is a field where you will you will never be right or wrong. It will always be a case of trade-off. Uh, so this is this is possibly you start uh, and you start with curiosity and your intent of solving a particular problem. Uh, this is, this yeah, is yeah. This. yeah. So even uh, like uh, for uh, processing learning and everything, even I, uh, I'm not sure like when I started, but it's totally interesting, right? So I was searching for something like how Uber and uh, this Ola captures uh, um, area of driver and how they get the ETAs of like how it in how many many time or how much time the driver will reach out to. So I went through some of the uh, papers or some of the like uh, links I got system design links. I have some of the newsletters I have from various writers around the world. So there I came to know like uh, how it works actually like uh, Ola oh, sorry Uber has their own uh, H3 hierarchical from there where they divide all uh, earth into a flat and then they do the hexagonal kind of thing. So that increased curiosity. And I think uh, that is a great way to learn if you want to really put your light, like how the things is going, right? So I'll add yeah. something over here. Uh, Dirgayu. So for a new person who is entering into this field, maybe, you know, uh, uh, maybe a fresher or maybe an experienced person, but now getting part into system design uh, discussions, uh, the first thumb rule or first thing to remember is it's an iterative process. It's not yeah. something that you can build at once. And I've seen uh, most of the folks doing this mistake that they try to think everything in the first place and not even start doing coding or start building uh, unless they think everything. So I think uh, uh, that's where uh, it's something that you have to keep in mind uh, every time and, and avoid analysis paralysis. Uh, so it's an iterative process, and especially for newbies in this particular field. So, got it, got it. and second, in my personal opinion, uh, any problem very similar to WhatsApp or Uber or Ola or any large company, they look enticing, but uh, the better way to start learning about or getting your hands on or comfortable with system design is to start with very small ideas, uh, as small as possible solving only just one problem. Uh, once you start that, you build something, you do some iteration in that, and then you add, keep on adding problems and use cases into that initial problem. And then you can come back to the original set of problem. And now you think again, try compiling all this 10 problems. So for example, you start with one use case, you keep on adding uh, and it becomes, let's say 10 use cases. And then you come back and now think again by taking all 10 together and now think whether your system design is getting changed or your hypothesis or theories or implement is getting changed when you think now all 10 together. So this way for a new person, uh, you would be becoming more confident and you would be learning from your own experiences and your own mistakes and implementations. So I think for a new person, this is a blueprint or a template uh, that one can go, uh, follow. This would take time so that that's why some people try to skip and take the 10th step uh, immediately. Yeah, I totally agree. Like one time, uh, one time I step, maybe we can say like not to focus yeah. on all the 10 yeah. things. Yeah. So uh, I just yeah. want to add, like as Sumit said, right, that 
system design or uh, creating any uh, system is an iterative process even even the largest of the companies they 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 with with thousands of you know experienced engineer can't make a product in one go i have seen uh, i have been work, worked in five companies so far and everywhere i have seen there is a need for refactoring the code or refactoring the design everywhere yeah. not even a single company where i haven't seen a project going on for refactoring so this clearly tells that even if you have thousands of engineers with lot of experience since the systems are so big it is not even possible that everything will be perfect in one go you go you create your mvp you start with then you start seeing other challenges for example the traffic on your system is low in the starting but it gradually grows then you realize that xyz part of your system is not capable to handle that and you go and your team refactors that as per the current requirements so uh, rishi said a good point like it system design is not correct or wrong it's always choosing between the trade offs and uh, you know iteratively building it so that's where the sumit said that you start thinking very small and then gradually grow and when you see that which system is not functioning properly Uh, with other systems you have to you know revisit it just don't go with like whatever i've decided first it is always correct yeah, just yeah, there is yeah. always scope to uh, refactor and reconsider whatever you have thought so yeah that's how you you can go ahead and you know build your knowledge slowly slowly yeah yeah definitely like on the recently uh, if i'll see i remember a scenario uh, like i read it around 5 year 5 days or 6 days back only Like Netflix, they change their system to join a front end only for the login and sign up page. So if the, these big giants are doing these things to just optimize the user experience and all, obviously it's a iterative process to learn. I, 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 SB... I, was, I was just about yeah, yeah. to say that if some beginner or fresher wanted to hmm. start with system design, why don't they start with you know creating a login system on first? Because that's hmm. the first thing which is start. And as you mentioned that Netflix has changed that. like yeah. you know so so start with a very very basic problem don't go with like i have to design uber or i no single engineer has designed ever like yeah. uber or anything like yeah. there is a team but start with a very basic stuff like for example logging your own login system this login and log out yeah that will be a good yeah. start two things two very important things that should be kept in mind throughout the process uh which would essentially can ensure that you are on the right path number 1 uh the user experience or the user requirement what that component of what that uh, uh particular system design needs to solve so user experience and second cost if these two if you are keeping in mind these two things rest everything are the tools to achieve it. at the end you would want your user to be uh make them do whatever they want to do for example they want to log in they want to place an order they want to make a payment they want to let's say update an order anything and the cost because while system designing if you do not consider any of these two at the end you would definitely have to refactor and major refactoring not just uh, code refactoring some but major refactoring uh so these two other things Um, and cost is something which i learned at a uh, very later stage when we actually at a later stage as in when i was building my own company because at that point in time i had very limited resources whereas when you work in a company if you get enough resources or you are not thinking about the cost yourself you tend to miss that point so cost can come in the form of a uh, uh, platform that you are using let's say new relic for monitoring it can come the cost of let's say postman or Uh, or any other tool that you want to do that particular system design or implement it uh, and a fundamental belief that i have any system basically people say right no system is correct or no system is perfect for me the cheapest system fulfilling the fulfilling the user experience is the best whether you have my monolithic or whether you have microservice or anything cheapest and solving the user experience or the goal that's it that's my uh, benchmark for a good system design
Kayu, you, your voice is not uh, clear. I don't know if it is with the other people. There are two Drigayu showing over here. Uh, maybe in the meantime, when they are sorting out the voice problem, uh, I can add one more point which I remember to what Sumit was mentioning, uh, uh, and 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 an acronym called MVP, most viable product, your minimum viable product. Sorry, uh, is mentioned here. Uh, in all the cases, even in system design, the purpose of minimum viable product should be to gather feedback how much feedback you can gather back from the customers for which you are building your business uh, and to solve your business, you are building a software system. So the more of the feedback you will be able to gather with that MVP, then using that feedback, as Ashish mentioned, then you will refactor. And then you will see, oh, because the feedback is saying, maybe I can reduce down the cost on a certain thing, but I need that cost to be put. Uh, and this is where uh, the trade-off thing comes into picture. Trade-off won't happen because you are starting with your own, uh, starting your own system design building without a feedback. Uh, all the business are built around feedback, uh, and I think uh, starting with MVP, you should be able to solve. Yep. Uh, Ashish, you wanted to add uh durga your voice is still not yet audible no no yeah maybe in the meantime uh sumit ashish we can discuss about uh, uh maybe even like if we are having a generic system design, a uh, very basic system design. How can we make it highly reliable, fault tolerant? How can we ensure that the that the purpose for which we build that particular system is being fulfilled? Uh, uh, what what are your take on that? So I, uh, so first thing I, uh, first uh, approach or the thumb rule is keep it simple. Uh, when people think of system design or when people start, you know, uh, Thinking in this direction, people start thinking about fancy technologies, fancy tech stack, uh, new new languages that are coming in the market, uh, all those things. But to me, it is always keep it simple. Uh, and it is very important uh, because, so, so it, it is important because if you will not keep it simple, you will eventually end up, uh, you know, not meeting the requirements of the consumer or the user. So, uh, keeping user at heart or in the center while you're system de designing a system is the second thumb rule. So, and third, keeping your team in the center because it, it's a team that would be building the whole system. So whatever the team's capabilities are, uh, you have to assess that as well while assessing the requirements of your consumer. Uh, so these are the three simple approaches or th three steps that I take or start considering. And then I take it forward uh, for discussing uh, discussion of the requirements or other things. But uh, in a gist, your, uh, you have to keep your system simple. Do not add complex technologies just for the sake of it. Uh, keep your user at heart and then keep your team at heart. And by team, I would obviously mean uh, the software engineers and the other stakeholders, for example, the operation folks uh, who would operate the system, let's say in your organization the business folks who are eventually getting the business because they actually are answerable to the clients or the consumers, right? The accounts folks who actually would take care of the whole uh, finances in the company and they have to be answerable, uh, you know, to the management. So the team would refer to all the, all the folks. So these are the three uh, simple rules that I follow uh, once I start building anything, uh, whether it's a new module or a whole system uh, from scratch. Adding on to the point, uh, what Sumit said is like, uh, always keep your system uh, simple and do not use any technology just because it's prevailing in market or it's being hyped in market. Yeah, uh, You should always uh, see 
that what is the requirement of your system and your consumers or your clients uh, for example like these days i have seen that microservices is in uh, you know picture like a lot of folks talk about it and when i gave interviews of goldman sachs uh, that guy told that our whole system is on monolithic and why do we want so some some person on a lunch table asked that why don't you move to microservice he he simply said because we didn't, don't need to uh, our system is perfectly working stack overflow is one of the classic example of monolithic system and it's working why do we why, why do they want to over complicate it uh, using microservices just just since it is in market but on the other hand, like com companies like, like uh, for example, Cap Booking, Ola, Uber, or other companies, they have to go for microservices architecture because different, different services will be involved and the architecture will be event driven, all those things, because their use case is like that. They, they might not be able to survive on uh, monolith uh, for various reasons. So keeping it simple and as per your requirements is the best. Just don't go for, uh, you know, over uh, hyped, complicated things just because your system will look good if you talk about it. It, it doesn't work that way in real life, I think. Yeah. Do not go for senior. I think this yes. should be at every wall in the software engineering yeah. team. Do not over engineer. Over engineering, I think it's the, it's, it's over killing your, killing your product at the very beginning. That's... Mm -hmm. it, it might not uh, even uh, ship right uh, in the right time because of that. Yeah, so over optimization. Uh, it, right. yeah, it's, it's, it does. So, so uh, let's let, meanwhile, we can also discuss, like, uh, for example, uh, when this system design problems or machine coding problems are being asked in uh, interviews, right? So, as a beginner or as a person who has not worked much in the industry, like us maybe, or uh, he's, he or she is just four to five or three to four years of experience. How, how can they tackle those challenges? How to present that thing in very crisp time in one hour uh, and want, you know, uh, in an interview. So. Uh. Yeah. Um, I can, I can put in my opinions first. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, system design, uh, and then you divide system design into two parts, high level system design and low level. So low level goes towards machine coding round. And then you have a, a high level design round where you sit down and then design the whole thing. Uh, if we talk about machine coding round or low level design round, the first, let's take it very practical. Let's think about that you are inside a team. They want to see if you are inside the team, will you be able to tackle a new problem? new new requirement so the first step should be that you are setting boundaries to what you want to build and then bringing clarity so you ask a lot of questions what do you actually want to build and then do not assume anything first ask to clear things set boundaries do not assume anything even if they say oh design a pen ask the definition of pen and then once you have those things in mind then as, and, and you start writing things. I mean, I can go down into uh, more processes of how do you bring out class name and everything. <clears throat> but let's say you have everything like, uh, oh, I don't want to build this particular design. Then while designing that system, always think about readability, testability, and maintainability. So if those three things are there, by readability means, let's say if I am writing something and then Ashish or Sumit, they are joining my team, they should not be, they should not be scratching their head like, oh, what the hell is there? Yeah. That's first. Mm -hmm. uh, second, if they want to, it should be testable. If they are changing something, the system should raise a red flag that, oh, I think this is not going right. And third is maintainability. Maintainability is when you are extending something. Uh, so if you are, if my product is now reaching to a million users and they want to extend more functionality, then they want to, they, it, it should be easy to extend. So I think, uh, and then you can learn more templates to do all these three things. But these are the basics, which which I understand that that should go along when you're doing a machine coding round. And maybe Ashish and Sumit, you can talk about the other portions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so adding to this, uh, Rishi, during an interview, I think uh, the most important thing that 
apart from these uh, specific uh, functional non functional requirement how you are presenting your thoughts to the interviewer this is an area of basically soft skills right during the interview so this is an area we have seen most of even good folks uh, uh, you know uh, not able to express their what's in their mind so uh, if, even if it has happened so many many times that i have to uh, specifically tell the person that you should use a notepad or something rather than speaking verbally so speaking verbally during the interview is a very bad start uh, or an impression for the interviewer so keeping a, uh, a track of your soft skills as well during an interview uh, is very important apart from the functional and non functional and other requirements of the interview i i i agree and and maybe before we move to ashish i can add two more points one is that uh, and this this uh, thanks to sumit i i i remember this um you and interviewer they should be knowing something in common and then you will be able to then then you guys will be able to understand each other very well for example you talk about design patterns so design pattern is the base you understand the design pattern you say the name the other person understands you move forward a little and then you say oh not only these design patterns but i am following a particular architecture while writing my code let's say clean architecture or hexagonal architecture or dome integral and then they'll they'll straight understand what have you written so that's also a form of communication so if you have these things and and if you're designing not writing the machine code designing something you follow some kind of schema maybe uml schema and then the other person understands so speak in the common language and then your communication will be much crisp uh, thanks so much uh, correct correct yeah so so most of the points you guys have covered i will just say that what helped me in uh, interviews in short span of time like let's suppose if someone asked me to uh, design uh, do a low level design of uh, chess game board game chess so what i always uh, started with like everything every point which you guys have said apart from that like uh, now coming to how do i present how do i build the system so i always go into the basic part of that like what is the most basic entity in the chess is it like is it a board or is it a uh, you know the square of that chess and the piece and then i start designing it from there like first you design uh there will be a square and then the square will be on the board then there will be pieces pieces will be acquired on that particular um square and then eventually i grow that into a whole lld system so in one hour like after writing down the requirements everything uh, i approach uh, like that so this this helped me and uh, i just don't start with a big things like there will be game controller or something something like that just i go to the basic entity like if we want to uh, let's suppose uh, design low level design of crick buzz or crick info i just uh, divide it into very small piece like what is the basic entity is one ball one ball will be done and six balls will create an over over and then what kind of ball it will be like when it is being uh, delivered like it might be white ball it might be no ball it might, might be six it might be one might be to it might be boundary so some something like that helped me uh, cracking interviews uh, also uh, when i design a system like going from the basic entity and then connecting the pieces this helped actually brilliant uh, yeah. thanks uh, ashish uh, so uh, maybe now we can talk about uh, like the a little high level design portion and then uh, in high level design portion let's say you have a system up there you have your servers up and running uh, you are receiving your traffic and everything else but then there will be chances that that serv those servers will go down let's say you are having a microservice architecture multiple services multiple uh, containers it's on kubernetes something but they might go down uh, it can happen uh, due to code issue hardware issue what what techniques uh, which you guys are using maybe practically uh, uh, to ensure that the 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 traffic is uninterrupted uh, the consumers they do not face the heat of your servers going down the business remains uninterrupted yes yeah yeah so so i'll, I'll go first 
so uh, while uh, so this when this happens uh, uh, it can happen anyways if you have thing even if you have thing through uh, even if you have done drills or anything right full planning it can happen even then so the most important thing is when you were building any system uh, did you took care of these scenarios so planning for these incidents is very important while you're building now how do we do it uh, let's talk a bit more practically so we think about uh, having redundancy in place so for example if we have a single container we always think about redundancy whether to deploy keep a second container deployed behind a load balancer so that the second container can take the the traffic uh, the only reason it will be able to do it when the first container died because of memory or resources constraints if the reason would be of code issue then both containers would die right so over here the uh, second point comes in a monitoring system how many containers are running where so a monitoring system and an alerting system on top of it so we currently use new relic for for this uh, which keeps a track of all the host the host and the application so both host and application and then we have alerts on top of it so that uh, those alerts come in immediately and the third where uh, those alerts are coming in whether your team is able to receive those alerts immediately and then act upon it a uh, lot of time the act because of inaction even if you have state of the art monitoring and alerting system because of inaction uh, you would face down times right so the alerts have to come in at such platforms or places whether it's phone call or email sms slack etc so you have to divide we we currently divide these alerts in priority order so the top priority of the company system is on phone calls so the team members would literally uh, literally see phone calls for that and then you have lower priorities and it can even go to emails as a lowest priority uh, and uh, the third is keeping a track of the uptime as well because you should have so we keep we use updown.io for that so which gives us the report of the complete uptime and the uptime percentage uh, in the history as well and that is important to back test our strategies to back test our team's capabilities uh, whether we were able to prevent downtime whether we were able to uh, fulfill our slas so slas having slas in the team is important so we keep our slas up to 99.95 or 96 Uh, as a bare minimum, and then we keep on tracking every month. So having a monthly cadence helps us uh, specifically. And then we have a two-week cadence for very quick fifteen twenty minutes of cadence, and then a monthly cadence for uh, deep diving into the issues that we had. So summing up, uh, having monitoring systems we use currently New Relic monitoring and alerting. Again, we use New Relic for system uptime. We use Updown dot io. Then we have an operational cadence, uh, weekly cadence for very small parameters. Uh, and then uh, we have a monthly cadence for deep diving into the issues the monthly cadence is very important because even if you have everything in place you are getting to know about it but if you are not solving it fundamentally in your architecture so identifying the fundamental root causes not just use case specific issues but fundamental root causes of those problems and then you fix these so repeat ratio has to, or the repeat occurrence has to be minimum or it has to be a downtrend in your uh, system so these are some things that we do practically i think most of uh, most of the things uh, sumit has covered and that's why i think uh, uh, besides all these things like uh, companies do uh, have a fallback system as well like if everything is correct in code and all and somehow some other things messed up or some site only messed up so they just rely on some uh, for for downtiming for preventing that they just have a replicated system somewhere else and then if one site is down by any how like even after having a robust uh, queue of all those uh, things then they this is uh, yeah correct so it like dr site then they make that other site cluster up and the business should not be impacted but yeah correct there is also some kind of sla associated with that like if one system is down and other cluster is getting up it will take some seconds of it so one thing is replicated system entire replica and then other comes like backup of the things which you have taken 
but there there is a difference between replication and backup actually backup will take a bit time to get loaded and replica system will have more cost obviously associated with it but it will be you know up in a very few seconds or few minutes uh, depending on the complexity of the system so those are the two things which company always prefer to have another site whatever things are running on one cluster should have been running in somewhere else which is just a back backup system like replicated site and recently i think even even if you'll see uh, instagram and facebook was down right like everyone would have so they would have thought through all the scenarios right and the companies are going on from more than a decade but still this happened and uh, even linkedin was down i think uh, some some day uh, last week for couple of hours in the midnight so those are the big system which which gets down so it it happens actually but the only thing we can do is like ensure from our end everything is good lot of all the big companies have on call engineers those who monitor those alerts but still things happen like we we should uh, try to consider the possible scenarios but yeah whatever applicable but things happen like yeah got it and who were in who know, don't know about this uh, instagram and facebook talk it was all meme content for everybody <laughs> yeah so their uh, engineers might be solving it but we were making memes of it fine yeah so uh, next thing like uh, for uh, considering the system design or if we start anything uh, building right so the major concern of other developers also or for the beginners is what to pick as a database either it should be sql or no sql so how would you like to take it this related to database uh, yeah okay i though i have not worked a lot towards the database side uh, i have couple of rules which sorry which i have for example uh, first decide what kind of uh, uh, do you need acid do you need it to be atomic uh, is it a fintech uh you are building or is it a youtube you are building so you divide your requirements uh and once you have divided those requirements then you have already divided into the type of databases you can go ahead uh no sql databases you can fine tune them towards atomicity uh but there will still be something which will be missing so uh if you want to have it like absolute atomicity uh the choice is that sql and then you vertically uh, scale it uh if you if you think that some portion of your uh data can go to uh known sql databases uh and then you you maybe you start with document uh, based database for example we have cosmos or uh, i think mongodb is also a document based database and then you can the, the the advantage of using those kind of databases is that the schema is quite flexible it won't complain if uh, a property is missing or added more so uh, two things uh, do you need acid properties or and is your schema going to be flexible uh, and then based on these you decide what kind of data this you want to keep uh, and possibly nowadays what is happening is that uh, you are having databases uh, by cloud providers which can act as more than one type uh, so you, you you can start with that uh, but this is uh, it's 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 a problem which if you do not tackle it at the very first at the very beginning it is going to be pain uh then yes this is, this is my take on this got it and more on how it's like to, if we want to divide our certain part or we can move to the microservice architecture on the same part like we have our authentication uh, or users database on a separate database and the main in different and we can have loggers on different database that approach is also doable right yeah that that that's quite correct i mean you you are not bound to keep all the data in the same kind of database you can right. absolutely yeah. data in, oh this type of data will go in this kind of database yes that's a, that's a very very valid point to value yeah. i think that's and that's one of the most important point because if you choose a wrong data uh, base for a wrong type of uh, or wrong nature of the data it is going to hurt you once your system becomes big uh, if your system is small it doesn't matter at all uh, uh but if your system becomes big it would definitely hurt you a lot 
for example uh, let's take an example of let's say catalog so everyone you know sees catalog on flipkart and amazon uh, and similarly i'll take another example with uh, let's say country delight right in both the applications you have catalog but there's a fundamental difference what is that fundamental difference in amazon's catalog you have uh, the items basically or the products or the skus you have those SKUs across very wide variety of uh, categories. So for example, an SKU in the uh, electronics or a fridge category, uh, the parameters or the attributes of a fridge would be very different from uh, a furniture, right? Or a sofa set. So in this kind of uh, cataloging, you it's very hard to implement it at scale using SQL. So for this kind of catalog, you would have to go with a NoSQL kind of structure. Whereas in Country Delight, the SKUs are all food products, right? So for uh, a Country Delight kind of system, you can go with SQL as well for your cataloging system. So this is a analogy which I found very interesting while uh, you know deciding SQL and NoSQL. Uh, and that's what I wanted to put out over here. Yeah, got it, got it, got it. So even the same thing, like uh, dividing the, uh, as per use dividing the database, I learned from my previous one of the company, which was on OTT based. So we have, we are implemented everything in AWS, right? So we are taking care of all user authentication because we were B2B. So our, we have thousand customers and again, the thousand having many thousands customers. So we simply kept our authentication system on uh, Firebase and then we moved it on, uh, like for the main system, we were using SQL again. I think, yeah, this is, this combination works around. And now next, like, uh, what about the tolerance and kind of trade-off between, like, how do we navigate between trade-off of consistency, availability, and tolerance or partition tolerance, we can say. What should be the strategy deploying these things? So it so, totally depends on your, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Sumit, go ahead. So it totally depends on, you know, your use case. So I'll take yeah. from a example, uh, while I was building the parking system, Right. So how we uh, how we applied cap theorem in that. So consistency, availability and partition. Uh, so you have two gates typically in a parking lot an entry gate and exit gate. Right. So when you're entering your number, your vehicle number would be feeded in. And then at the exit, your number would be matched. And accordingly, your amount would be calculated over here uh, in this use particular use case. If there is a partition tall, if there's a uh, partition or maybe a network, you know, disruption between the entry and exit gate, what would be the most important factor for your consumers, whether it be consistency or availability, right? Uh, it has to be availability because you cannot, if the system is not available, you cannot stop someone from going out from the parking lot. It might happen that you, you know, might calculate wrong results, wrong amount, right? Uh, so for example, if, uh, the data is syncing between server and the client devices or between entry and exit devices. Uh, the amount could be less than what it actually is. But that won't be much of an issue if you're not able to move the customer out of the of the parking lot. So in this particular use case, availability was the uh, highest pri of our highest priority. And then similarly, you can uh, understand use case by use case. So, uh, uh, but really understand from a user specific point of view what matters in banking it would be consistency right you cannot mess up even one rupee yeah you can tell for example atm right you can tell the customer okay this is the, at this time you cannot withdraw cash but you cannot withdraw wrong cash right so it's it's very uh use case specific and keeping customer at heart got it. it was a great example by the way and uh like a lot of times you might have even i have actually uh like i have couple of accounts on Instagram and I, if I am following same persons on in Instagram, I see that Instagram is a available, high available system, not consistent system yeah. because, because on my one feed, I can see somebody else posted and it is coming up. But on the other hand, I, I don't see on the other account, it is being reflected in a minute. It reflects after two minutes, three minutes. Okay. So that clearly shows that Instagram is a available, highly available system, but not a consistent system. So as Sumit said that uh, it, it really depends on uh, the use case. Uh, so for parking system, obviously wrong amount is okay. But if you are uh, <laughs> making uh, customers inside the parking hall, that <laughs> will create a chaos uh, rather than like this. So it's important that they should move out. It's okay. If the amount is calculated wrong. You will take a loss there. Uh, 
and similarly in banking you can't say that you have withdrawn 10000 and because of your systems are not consistent it is not updated and user again withdrew 10000 it's always okay to stop that okay atm is not working or some system is not working so don't do transaction but not to do wrong transaction so yeah basically totally depends on use case and that's what cap theorem also says that if you have a network distribution uh, partition so you have to always choose between consistency and availability that there, there is only one thing which is which can be fully uh, available there and eventual consistency is something that uh, so if you are choosing availability then as a second priority you can choose eventual consistency so again in case of parking what we did so let's say if these exit device because of the network partition it's calculating let's say a certain amount let's say 30 rupees instead of 40 and then when the network will come in the amount will be again calculated as 40. So we would keep that uh, as a uh, negative balance in that particular customers. Uh, let's say if the customer is identified using a 95 uh, in that, and then you can say to the customer again in the next visit that this is the additional amount that you have to pay. So eventual consistency is something uh, I think which is not very specifically put it in the original cap theorem, but then there are extensions to cap theorem where it says you have to achieve eventual or should achieve eventual consistency in the system as well. Yeah, yeah, got it. So, uh, like one of the like most of the question like your beginning and uh, moving into system design. There is a one question always like how to is the interview kind of thing because somebody has learned something, but if it's going to another any another company, they are using different systems. Right? So, how we can synchronize with the uh, like let us train first of all, and second, how this event driven programming and event driven uh, technologies that we are using currently is focusing on the responsibility and adaptability of the system design. Uh, okay, I, I I can put in my opinions and then maybe Ashish and Sunit, you guys can join. Um, first is, if you are working in a company where you are using certain set of tools, for example, Sumit is using New Relic, but the same other company can be using a competitor of it. So how do you how do you let the interviewer know that you know that particular thing always divide your learning into two parts whatever tool you are learning the tool is practical but there is a principle behind it so you learn the principle first uh okay ci cd pipeline is the principle jenkins is the tool yeah. instead of jenkins you can do something else uh so you learn the principle first and if you talk on the it's called t level uh so you know the the upper bar of t that's generic so you can talk to anyone i can talk to ashish in the the, the generic one but i i don't want to go deep or maybe i want to go deep that depends on the other person and that might happen if the other person is also using the same tool or if they have some curiosity so you should always be aware of the principles you're using and then start your learning from there that okay this is what i'm learning yes. uh and uh the second i'm sorry uh the, can you please repeat the second portion of the, of the question it was about event-driven programming, right? So event-driven programming, uh, yeah. how it is. Right. Um, okay. I I would like to take one example here is that uh, um, let's say there are two servers, two servers which or two different companies talking, company A, company B. And uh, somebody talks to company A. Uh, let's take an example of uh, uh, booking.com or what's the what's the movie booking site? There's a movie, book my show. Uh, so you, you talk to book my show, book my show talks to somebody else who is a, like a PVR cinema. So three ways you can have that conversation. First, you talk to book my show, book my show keeps the connection open, keeps you hanging there. And it talks to PVR cinema and that connection remains open. So every, the whole connection is hanging there. That's one way. And it is wasting your time. It's called synchronous communication. The second can be that. Uh, book my show can directly can basically send a request with a request ID to uh, to the other PVR cinema or somebody and they will reply back with that particular request ID. In this case, the communication is not dependent to stay hanging. Like when you will send me a reply with the particular request ID, I will I will act on that. You have broken that barrier of keeping it synchronous communication. But the problem here is that what if PVR cinema is not available? then your request which you are sending with the request ID is gone and then I'm sitting there waiting for my book ticket to come in. 
not going to happen. So that's the third part which we talk about and we put in something called messaging queue. Messaging queue is another system which will take in the request from the middle tier application, which is book by show. And then the other party, PVR Cinema or somebody, they will be able to retrieve that information once more than once. If something happens, maybe again, uh, that depends on how you're building it. So advantage is that now you're having somebody who can take care of the communication and make it asynchronous. You are not keeping everybody hanging there. The disadvantage is that if you do not design it well, then you are introducing another component, which can be single point of failure. If you're not designing well, which can be single point of contention or, and then pain in the system design. So uh, that's another aspect that you have to design it well, but by bringing in asynchronous communication principle here, we are putting in messaging queue in between. Yes. Got it. Yep. So, uh, Ashish, do you want to put some light yes, on it? Yes, so as uh, Rishi mentioned that uh, it's it totally depends on the use cases. Like, And uh, for for example, now I'm working uh, working with Uber and I see that event-driven programming is is the is really important for use cases uh, like this. So just giving you an example, uh, for example, if your trip, when your trip gets complete, right? Like, uh, so you want to generate receipts after that or you want to you know calculate the discounts they got or you want to credit the amount to the driver's account you want to show you want to you know some service will want to show that whether it's an online payment should the money be deducted from online or they have to pay cash different services and they all rely on one response which is whether the trip is complete or not correct so what, what event-driven programming here plays a very, very vital role. Like what they'll do, the service, which is taking care of your trip, trip service example, what they'll do, they'll just publish a message in a message queue or some sort of create an event that, okay, your trip is in progress. It's beginning different, different enums you can take, right? And once it is complete, it will push a message there and the services which relies on that will consume that event like publisher subscriber or something like that so it is kind of like really depends on what kind of use cases you are making and if you have the use case you you definitely have to use that uh, tech thing in your systems got it yeah so uh, now so now I think it's time for uh, taking some questions from audience also. So we have a one question like for consistency, which type of database should be used? SQL. SQL. Yeah. Right. And apart from it, uh, like when we go for any interview, right? Like most of the common question that any of the student of beginner face is what is the first thing and how this book my show is working? And second is how the Tatkal system, Tatkal ticket, ticket booking is working. So it's always no good to know how to ace this kind of interview questions. Um, okay, I can I can I can take an example. Actually, when I was preparing for my system design interviews, yeah. As a beginner, I was trying really hard to memorize how Uber is working. Uber is one of the, like the hard problem in system design. And that was the issue. I don't have to memorize how Uber is working. Understand the problem. And then you know the tools available. Then build your own Uber. Okay. Maybe Uber actual company. Uber actual company is having a team of 100 plus engineers who are building Uber. You can't replicate that in like an hour. But what the other person wants to know is, it's a form of problem solving skill. Okay, so you take the problem, so you ask what is Uber and then divide into requirements and then see that the knowledge of the tools which you're having, how do you fit in those requirements into that, that tools? Do not get overwhelmed by just hearing the problem because we, when we say, oh, Uber, automatically in our mind, or, or we say Instagram, automatically in our mind, we know, oh, it's, a, it's, it's something which is being used by billion people. Do you actually want to build this for billion people in one hour interview? 
or do you want to build it from scratch and then modify depending on the requirements so do not get overwhelmed by the the enormity of the problem which you are having start small uh, as sumit said at the very beginning start very simple and then add only components when they are necessary this is this is my advice so taking these names of the companies right uber ola etc it's a proxy for saving time by the interviewer uh, you have to understand that uh, otherwise interviewer will keep on explaining the problem and you might not even understand so it's just a proxy uh, that's it and uh, uh, as as uh, everyone said that especially lay uh, lay down the problem statements or the requirements of the interviewer and the and the uh, and the system that's being built so do not get threatened away or uh, overwhelmed by these by any of the terms it just it, it it explains the use case in one word yeah. like if you will say that design amazon uh, definitely that what all features are there in amazon you will get to know you will write down the requirements as per your your mvp which you want to create in that one hour and you have to deliver obviously like a whole company cannot be built in one hour and it, it is not not possible and if somebody is expecting that i think we do not join them <laughs> correct So yeah, I think uh, we had a good discussion uh, on two different. We yeah, have a few and... questions like uh, one is how can one prevent server downtime issues in system dev? I think that is also uh, uh, covered, right? So we uh, so we said and you have already answered that. Right? So the next thing is best way to tackle high availability issues on message broker services. Anyone want to take it up? Yeah, uh, we say yeah. So we say you want to take it. I I'll take it up. So yeah, yes. uh, the high availability, the principle to achieve high availability for message broker, it would be very similar to any system, right? Because message broker is also a system at core, right? Which someone has written, whether it's Kafka or Rabbit MQ or any other thing else. So and the principles that are there is redundancy number one, right? So uh, for high availability, you need to have redundancy in place. Uh, second, resources computation or resources allocation. uh how much resource you allocating in terms of cpu and ram and the storage uh and then third monitoring right uh are is your system able to monitor the downtime and immediately uh able to up another instance of that particular message broker so uh, the concept would be very similar to any service or a back end code or a uh, any the system that's being built so in short uh, so if you'll read Uh, uh and i don't i don't think any i i have worked with multiple message broker services and i have not seen any specific at least to my knowledge any specific point to achieve high availability with a particular message broker uh it's the same for every other system the components could be different the number of components could be different for example for kafka the components the number of components to uh, uh Uh, make kafka up and running is different from rapid mq but the principles are the same so no, we had another similar question i think you already answered the same question like it is how to monitor and debug the distributed system for bottleneck performance and all so if you want to put any additional to it because you already answered it but still if you want to put any uh, high point or something either ashish or rishi yeah i think, uh, I, I can take this and maybe ashish if you want to fill in Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rishi, you can go ahead. No worries. Okay. Um. So, I will continue from where the Sumit Sumit left. Sumit talked about a system which is taking care, which is basically monitoring. Let's let's say the whole system is called telemetry. Uh. What we usually do in big companies or good companies who want to monitor their system is that from their code, whenever the code is it's it's. getting process whatever request is coming in you are emitting metrics so okay this is the metrics uh, which is saying request processing time or number of times you are you are returning 4xx or number of times you are returning 5xx and that metrics thing is actually going to the system telemetry which is showing you in real time how your system is behaving okay this is one aspect that you are emitting metric but the other aspect is that you are being very conscious of what kind of metric you want to emit you don't want to emit a lot you only want to emit the thing which you want to measure for example uh 
initially when Google, so I was reading this time, initially when Google was uh, trying to see how to do their page rank algorithm, uh, they were they were monitoring that how much time a user is spending on the first page. And they were saying, oh, then the result is good. But actually that was not happening. Then they started monitoring how much, how many times user is actually coming back. So if you go inside a link and then you read it and then you come back to the Google search, that means you are trying to search the same thing again. That means your results are not efficient. So you have to be very conscious of what you want to measure. For example, if you want to measure your performance issues, then you look at the request processing time. If you want to see a potential failure, then you also look at how many times your pods are getting restarted. So being conscious of what you are emitting and then looking at that at real time in your telemetry dashboard, uh, that is how you will basically see, oh, this is how system is performing. Maybe I want to roll back something, maybe I have to fail or on something. Uh, so this is my take on this. And I, Ashish, uh, please, please fill in uh, your thoughts. I think this. most of the things uh, you have covered, uh, like you, in any company where I worked also, they, they emit metrics consciously because that also comes with the, uh, with the cost. And uh, it looks simple, but when when you are emitting a simple metric and millions and billions of people use it, it creates, uh, you know, a huge chunk. And then you need to filter it out also. Like even, so one of the things is that, and the other things are like, we do logging also in a system. So let's suppose metric is being emitted, correct? And you get an alert also that, something is not correct some some error rate has increased then the second point is you have to have those conscious logs in your system which will tell you that where exactly the failure was so that's how the bigger systems uh, i think are tackled uh, when there are any issues or debugged and uh, again emitting logs also comes with the cost not only the cost of uh, you know uh, systems but when a person analyzes a log and there are a lot of unnecessary logs in the system, obviously the time taken to, you know, mitigate the issue will increase. And that is also, if your system is down, let's suppose, and somebody is trying to mitigate and it is also taking time, then that is also associated with a cost, which is not quantifiable, but obviously the more the delay, the more the loss. So those all things I think uh, are used for monitoring or debugging any system and then uh, rest all the things which Sumit has uh, covered in the beginning. So that, that's how we, we try to build up uh, and resolve bottlenecks, performance issues and uh, whatever potential failures we have, then we debug those things and mitigate the incidents or any issue that comes in. Yeah, I well, I think that it's time to wrap up. Like it was a very uh, good discussion. I missed out sometimes like a, a, a due to technical release. I'm sorry for that. But yeah, I think it's a good discussion among us. I think you, yeah, we can you haven't up. done fault tolerant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you, and you it was something to identify the bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it replicated my ID and then all of a sudden I was just locked out. I don't know how I don't know how it happened, but yeah. Uh, the authentication token must have expired. Oh, maybe. <laughs> Debug it. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely. I'll. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you so much for the session. I'm pretty sure it would have been very insightful for all that all those who joined. We had quite a few number of people who are live on LinkedIn and YouTube as well, uh, posting in questions. Even in the community also, there were a few questions that were shared. So... Uh, people are happy that you were able to get time to also take those questions up really happy to have you guys for the uh, panel discussion thank you so much for you know taking off your time and coming here like that thank you so much yeah thank have you, you. Yeah, thanks very nice Bye. Uh, Bye.